I can't build another Sequoia. I can't. It's, it's when it's gone, it's gone. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. And uh, today we're going to tell you how I spent my summer vacation. We've got about nine trays of slides here. Should get through it in about four and a half hours. It's amazing watching the kids out there by the giant twine ball in Minnesota. It's really I got hundreds of shots just of that. Actually, uh, we did uh, go up to, uh, to Sequoia National Forest. It's about a three and a half, four hour drive for us. This was Natasha's first Fourth of July as a U.S. citizen, and it seemed like a good place to go. Um, you'll hear me making this comment throughout the course of this episode. It is impossible to describe the sensation of a sequoia until you see one. It is impossible for you watching on TV or, or still images to have any idea of the jaw-dropping awe that these creatures inspire. Uh, we have an extremely beautiful country here. I think without question, the most beautiful country in the world, if not just because of the uh, just sheer amount of variety. But even the Grand Canyon did not have the effect on me that, that the sequoias did. The, the, the entire drive into the mountains, you're surrounded by California redwoods. And these are very, very big, very, very large trees. And as we were, as I was driving up the first time 10 or 12 years ago, I thought, okay, look, there's some big trees here. So this is going to be great. And then you turn the corner after seeing these enormous, enormous California redwoods. You turn the corner and you see the first actual sequoia. And, and it's a one lane highway each way. And you stop that car and you pull over and you simply cannot believe that such a thing exists. Now. We went to a part that we had not gone to before. We went to a part on the northern end, and there's an area there called the Trail of 100 Giants. Uh, sorry to report that it's now the Trail of 93 Giants, but that's the point of what I want to talk about today, guys. Uh, as you walk through this astonishing thing, there's a 2,000-year-old tree. Here's the largest living thing on Earth by volume. These sequoias have 2 billion leaves. They're 300 feet tall. You know, on and on with all these statistics. But statistics don't help you either. You simply stand there. As you can see in these images, you simply stand there. And it's not possible to believe this thing is real. Unfortunately, as we continued along this trail, we saw uh, the bottom of a root system, which is extremely wide, but stunningly shallow. Really, there's no tap roots, nothing. It's just essentially a pedestal. And uh, a sequoia was lying on its side and it looked to me like a dead body on the trail. And what was worse is as we got closer, we found out that this one sequoia had fallen across the already downed uh, uh, bodies of, of two sequoias that came down together at the same time. There's a famous uh, sequoia that had a, a tunnel cut into it. People would drive their cars through there. I think that was done in the 30s or something. That's not around anymore either. So, uh, guys, here's the here's the part of the story that becomes really unbearable for me. The most recent sequoia that fell down fell down in 2019. If you want to see and hear what it sounds like when an entire ecosystem goes down, not just a big tree, I mean just an entire world unto itself goes down. Uh, on the 2000, um, on one of these uh, events, there was a German tourist who happened to catch it briefly as he was running for his life and good for him. This is what it looks and sounds like when, when a giant uh, of this size falls down in the forest. Uh, Steve, uh, when we found that the one sequoia had fallen across the other two, the two had grown together for 1,800 years and now they're down and three of them down in the space of seven or eight years. Something's wrong. Walking down the length of these trees that had caught fire after they'd fallen, it was impossible to describe the sensation. Natasha got it exactly right. She said, it's like a plane crash. These things are as wide as a jet. They're as long as a jet or longer. And it's, it's, it's just wreckage and, and destruction. And, and, and it's so tragic that it just stops your, your heart. I went to look at the video to find the video of the thing falling, and right after that, I saw a video that claims to have an explanation for it. And I am using this video as an example. There's two sides to every story. This is the side I heard with that said. Back in 2005, the people that were managing the Trail of a Thousand uh, Giants made a decision to cut down what they called nuisance trees. These were non-sequoias. They weren't big redwoods. They were just relatively small pine trees that they were concerned could drop on people on the trail and so on. And they were far away from the root systems of the sequoias. So let's just cut them down and, and, and save ourselves, you know, some, some potential um, damages. It's all done in the best of intentions. That was in 2005. 
In 2011, the twins went over. And in 2019, the other one fell on top of them. These trees have been around for 2,000 years nearly. So something's going on. And what we found out was, at least is what the video claims, is that these nuisance trees, these tiny regular trees that are in the, amongst these giants, protect the sequoias from strong winds. They basically break up the winds. And, and when it rains an awful lot, they suck up the excess moisture, the excess rainwater from the ground. And when you cut them down, the full force of the wind hits the sequoia. And when it rains heavily, the ground underneath that shallow root system essentially just turns to quicksand. And these 2,000 year old trees start to blow over because of what we did with the best of intentions. And this is not the first time that we've done this as humans. We've been trying to repair the damage that we've done through our ignorance for 50 years now, but we seem to be making the same ignorant mistake. And, and that mistake essentially comes down to we not only don't appreciate how interconnected things are, we cannot appreciate how interconnected things are. The way to save nature is to leave nature alone. Yeah. Yeah. What a great way to put it. This, this is a story near and dear to my heart. I grew up I mean, climbing trees was one of my activities as a kid, one of my main activities. And the higher up you could get in the tree, the cooler the kid you were. Um, and in fact, Melissa and I bought our first house based in part on this beautiful climbing tree in the back wall. It split into three parts. And I'm, like, I'm going to teach my kids how to climb this tree. And then the city made us cut it down and we sold the house. True story. Um but I also spent four years in Northern California, far Northern California, Humboldt County, behind the Redwood Curtain, we called it. I have lived amongst these trees. I've camped amongst these trees. And as you said, pictures, video, don't do it justice, what these forests are like. It's unreal. It's unearthly. Um, there's a reason George Lucas shot the, uh, the Endor exterior scenes in the Redwoods, because you, it's it's an alien world right here on Earth. You don't need to decorate the set. You don't need CGI. You just set up the camera and people go, there's no way those trees exist on this planet. That's right. But they do. They're real. I've lived there. They take your breath away. I would, I would, I would love to go back there right now if I could. Um, and when you get to far northern California, you don't have the tourism problem that you have further south. Uh, there are just far fewer people, far fewer tourists. You can get in there amongst the trees without worrying about harming the environment at all. But you know what? I'm, I'm in one sense, I'm not a tree hugger. That is, I love human development. I love our cities. I love our suburbs. I love our big trucks and all the rest of it. And we need our areas for all of that. But one of the beauties of the, the national park system and the national, the national forest is we've reserved these areas, these beautiful areas, to be natural. They're supposed to be natural. So the way to stop screwing it up is to stop screwing with it. Yeah, the national park system in the United States is one of the things that we should be most proud of. I think there's Absolutely. 23, 24, 25 of them, every one of them breathtaking. Uh, Scott, I mentioned that we were not new to this, um, and I'm reminded of a story that maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 years old, maybe even older now, and it had to do with another one of our national parks, which I'm virtually positive was Yellowstone. And basically what the story in Yellowstone was, lightning would strike trees, the, the, the ground brush would catch fire, the trees would take some damage, but they're evolved to take a little fire damage because lightning strikes have been happening for a lot longer than there's been a park service, yeah. right? And so we decided, no, we don't want any forest fires in our park. So for a number of years, decades, anytime lightning would start a natural fire, we went in and put it out. Good for us. We're protecting the trees. Well, what we were actually doing was allowing two or three decades of undergrowth to build and build and build and build and build so that when a fire finally came that we couldn't contain, there was so much fuel there that would normally have been burned away regularly as part of the natural cycle that it actually killed the trees that normally would have had no problem with this. And after you hear stories like this, you think that we would have a better idea of the fact that our best possible intentions aren't good enough. We've had the same situation where we try to reintroduce wolves or move wolves. Mm. It, it, it's just like, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Yeah, I remember watching a video, and this may have been a Yellowstone thing too, about they, 
they tried to get wolves out of an area, I guess. And when they got the wolves out of the area, the predation of herbivores uh, stopped. And so the herbivores didn't uh, eat the grass where they needed to. And, you know, like this whole cascade. They of changed things. the course of rivers. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, it's funny because when I, I ran a Christian children's camp and at one point I was all about the kids engaging with nature. So I said, hey, let's just let's mow the grass over by the stream so the kids can get down in it. And I talked to a guy who was an expert in this kind of stream riparian environmental, whatever it was. And he said, um, you don't want to do that. If you do that, then the stream will then begin to break down the banks. And uh, because the grass that's growing close to the streams and the, the high weeds are actually c- creating a structural integrity that allows the stream to flow in its natural course. It reminds me of when I read uh, or listened to the book, uh, The Great Mississippi Flood, um, where the efforts by the Army Corps of Engineers to uh, channel waters to protect people from getting flooded actually exacerbates the problem because essentially then when you get an influx of new water from melt uh, from the snow-covered mountains or from heavy rains, you wind up scouring deep channels where they've tried to constrain the banks of the river, where the river naturally wants to overflow its banks, flow gently out over the fields and things like that, and then recede gently back within its banks. But if you channel it, you you create a mighty force that just fires through there and tears up the ground and throws things everywhere. It's just over and over again, I'm reminded of John Calvin's phrase, when he said, nature is the theater of God's glory. And we're always trying to rewrite the play. We think we have a better idea. We think we can make this uh, more a more satisfactory setting or ending. Um, and it's what we find in the course of it is actually just one of the magnificent things about God, that, that sort of God is, is wild and creative and innovative and self-sustaining and, and, and weaving things together in ways that make them um, ever-changing and yet somehow able to sustain themselves. Rarely do pioneers come upon a new area of the earth and go, holy cow, God's made a mess of this. I mean, we need to straighten this out. Usually they're in awe of the magnificence of it all. And they come up over the ridge and they see the forest laid out before them for miles around. And, and it's just incredible. Even when I came out to visit you, Bill, in California, and you said, oh, here's where we had that forest fire. And it came right down to the highway. And, it, it, and you could see that the soil had been blackened. But from the blackened soil, you could see plants emerging. Like so soon after what we would see as devastation, but that's not the way creation works. And the more we monkey around with it, the more difficult it becomes. Now, obviously, we have to make provision for our own living spaces. You know, I've got to carve out a half acre so that I have a place to live. But it doesn't mean that I have to go in and start destroying uh, the forest around me or altering it or making it more acceptable uh, to my way of seeing things. I think that even science would show us that if we trust the web of of nature uh, to to and rem- keep its integrity as much as possible, um, then we'll have stuff to look at for a much longer time. And there are times when you're going to go to a national park and you're going to see an area that's been burned over by a forest fire. And you're going to say, oh, kids, I guess this is bad. We'll never come back here again. No, come back next year. <laughs> On the drive down and on the drive up, the wildfires hit Sequoia a year or two ago, and everything's burned out. And then I went through a part of the park where the fire hadn't been. Everything's green. It'll all be green again in a short time. Um, there, the, here's the thing about the Sequoia trees, folks. They only exist in one place in the world, and that place is exceedingly small. The conditions have to be absolutely perfect in terms of the amount of rain, the temperatures, all of it. Just this one little patch on Earth, the sequoias are so unique that every one of them is an individual. Each one of them is known. Many of them are named, but all of them are individual trees. That's how few of them there are and how rare they are and how spectacular they are. The decision to cut down those trees was not made uh, with malice. On the contrary, this decision was made to try and make it easier for Americans to experience this wonder. So if we're if we're looking at ourselves as doctors trying to help heal our 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 own errors or or to keep things healthy, then we should remember that as doctors, we should take the Hippocratic Oath. And the first part of the Hippocratic Oath is, first of all, do no harm. Do not make things worse. That's the first thing that a doctor is trained to do. Don't make things worse. They are irreplaceable. When you see those fallen trees, your first reaction is, okay, well, they'll grow back. They will grow back. 
and in 2000 years, they'll be about the same size they are now. These trees were saplings at the same time as Christ was a sapling. They've seen it all. They've seen the Middle Ages. They saw the Reformation. They saw the World Wars. They saw all of it. They've been there and now they're down. Um, I have a, a visceral revulsion to the idea of boundary lines and trails. When I went to the Grand Canyon several years ago, uh, it was a lovely experience, except the only part of it that I didn't like was that you didn't get to see the Grand Canyon. And the reason you couldn't see the Grand Canyon was because there were lines of, of park rangers who made sure that nobody got too close to the edge of the Grand Canyon to fall into the Grand Canyon. And so we didn't get, we saw the Grand Canyon in the distance, we never got to look down and see how deep the canyon was. Now, this is the point. If some, if some idiot or, or, or somebody careless falls off the edge of the Grand Canyon, then the Grand Canyon's not going to go away. That's, the Grand Canyon's not going to feel that. But the root systems on these trees are so shallow and so, and so sensitive that walking up to touch them, which is, a, which is irresistible, you have to touch them. Their bark is like sponge. You have to. You just have to. And me walking up across the shallow root system of a tree that's as wide as 40, 50 feet wide, my walking up and touching that tree is not going to hurt that tree's roots. But a few million of us doing this every year will. And, and so I find myself very reluctantly thinking, no, in this particular case, we need to have walkways and we need to have that enforced. And hopefully they can build some close enough so that you can, you can touch one. We are destroying the foundations of these irreplaceable giants, and I don't want that to happen. I can't build another sequoia. I can't. It's it's when it's gone, it's gone, and uh, and the magnificence of them is something that everybody should experience, and that means everybody into the future. And so let's do our best. And if it turns out that we have to reassign the national forest to the national park or whatever the case may be, and if it turns out the only way to see them is to stay on that um, on that pathway, like in that uh, Sound of Thunder thing, and if you step off, you're going to alter the future, you know, by stepping on a, a science fiction, you're just going to step on a, on a butterfly, you're going to change the future. Well, if you step off the track, you may change the future of these trees. My final thought is, Three of these have gone down in just a couple of years. How many more are now going to be uh, at risk because of, of what we've done? How long will it take? Those trees, those hazard trees will grow back relatively quickly, but we're still talking about 20 or 30 years at least. So I hope it's going to get worse. But more than anything, I hope we finally learn our lesson about nature. My friend Jim said something that I thought was so deeply profound. I'll, I'll, not, I'll never forget it. He said, everything in nature is true. I thought... Yeah, bees don't make mistakes. Trees don't make mistakes. Everything in nature is true. It's automatically true. And and this kind of truth needs to be preserved. So go and see them. Just don't step on their feet and pray for the best because they deserve it. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on Red Angle.